Okay, so we are on page 52 of the notes number 20, and I was in the middle of uh, explaining um, how we can split up our, our wave field, how we can split up our data set. So I talked about how our data sets contain uh, shear waves and P waves, you know, and, of course, and we're going to be looking at P waves almost exclusively, uh, as it turns out. So that's not such a useful way of splitting up our data set. Here's, for us who are looking at P waves, here's a really useful way of, of splitting up our data set. Uh, and this goes back to my thesis and, and also to some work by my, my office mate, uh, Ronan Lebra. Um, and uh, we split up the, the data set using these, these Feynman type diagrams into uh, direct waves and interacting waves. And, you know, these red circles are the points of interaction you can see I've flagged as interaction, either a refraction or a uh, reflection. So it's some kind of wave conversion. And if, if I'm going to think about S waves, then of course a P to S wave conversion is another interaction. Uh, a source, you know, an exploding reflector is an interaction. Okay, so that's, uh, uh, that's where we, uh, we get that. Uh, that's the basics of that view. So, so uh, any th uh, all waves are considered direct waves if this is all that happens to them. Okay, geometric metric spreading, attenuation, if we allow that, and ray bending, you know, according to velocity. All right, and anything if anything else happens to that wave, then we consider it an interacting wave. All right, so it interacts with the medium, you know, with the velocity changes. Uh, with the density changes, with the reflectivity, with the acoustic impedance at certain places to send energy in directions that, that a direct wave wouldn't predict. You know, that, that geometric spreading or attenuation uh, you know, can't predict. Okay? So sending energy in other directions that direct waves don't go. Uh, and. Uh, I'm very, uh, very much a fan of this. Uh, this is really Kirchhoff's uh, idea, uh, and also uh, a physicist named Born. Um, I'm a very, I'm a big fan of this idea that any interacting wave you can break down into a sum of direct waves, you know, which which have no interactions, plus an effect of the interaction that looks like a source. Okay. And I'm coming from a, uh, uh, the viewpoint of a uh, kind of a, well, for you guys, it's an extremely early paper. And it was kind of an early paper in my career by uh, Katie Aki and, uh, at, at MIT and uh, Wu Lu, um, who was visiting him then from, uh, from China. So, uh, uh, you know, and, and our exploding reflector model, this is it in space. Okay? Instead of a reflection, an interacting wave, we have a source. We have an exploding reflector. So the exploding reflector model takes this in spades. So we're, um, what we're trying to do now is uh, we're trying to draw geological information out of these interactions of the waves at boundaries. And another way of putting that would be then how, you know, what do these sources look like and what information, what geological conclusions, what geo, uh, geomechanical conclusions, can we get out of that? Um, I, I was, uh, uh, you know, 20 years ago, I was thinking that, that I could get um, geological conclusions, stratigraphic conclusions, uh, you know, maybe density conclusions out of it. And uh, lately, it's come about that, that probably, you know, depending on how uh, reflections, say, from fractures or fracture sets look like, um, look like sources that radiate in different directions, you can even gain geomechanical conclusions out of those reflections, out of those interactions. Okay, so um, that's that's where I get my idea that we can look at uh, uh, data sets like the uh, 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 the the uh, the Soda Lake uh, 3D three component data set, and we should be able to pick out eventually. Not just the anisotropy from the fracture sets, but also the amplitude versus azimuth effects of reflections off fracture sets, individual fractures, fracture zones, fracture sets. 
So uh, uh, you know, geological, geomechanical information is available from the from these reflections. Um, now there are there are two ways. Uh, there are two pieces of information in our seismic data uh, that we use, you know, through imaging, through um, migration, uh, to um, uh, to try to make an interpretation of, of uh, geology or geomechanics. And the main thing that we've been talking about so far, and the thing we'll keep talking about in this class, is what can we get from the timing of wave arrivals and and. I could summarize that as, you know, what can we get from the phase of the of the waves, okay? Um, and that's a that's a kinematic view. That's kinematic information. Okay, it tells you about velocity, uh, tells you about geometry and structure, and that for a lot of purposes that's enough. And that's really 99 percent of what we work on in this class is is about the phase, the kinematics, the timing, the geometry. Um, now, what I, I do want to ask the question, though, what can we get from the amplitudes of the waves? Okay, that's the dynamic question. Okay, you know, what can we get uh, if we know the amplitudes of the waves? We know something about the level of stress, the level of strain. You know, we can infer all that sort of thing, um, and. Uh, do we get more? You know, can we get more than the geometry, the uh, um, uh, the velocity out of the the amplitudes of the waves? Okay. Well, the amplitudes, if we can get them, can tell us something about the medium around the interface. And I, I, obviously, I'm talking about amplitudes of reflections. So here's that that classic, you know, normal incidence P wave reflection. Okay, uh, where um, uh, and this little p over here, that's the ray parameter, right? We have a flat reflector uh, and um, you know zero dip, and the ray parameter is zero, which means the wave is coming straight down or straight up. And the 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 source, the wave from the source, the source wavelet s of t, uh, you know most of the uh, in in most reflectors, uh, most of the energy is transmitted through. We're not worrying about that. We get back a reflection along the same path. R of t along the same ray, um, and uh, above the uh, um, above the interface, we have density rho one, uh, p velocity alpha one, and s velocity beta one. Below the interface, we have rho two, alpha two, beta two. So at normal incidence, okay, uh, for elastic waves, we've got this you know simple classic. Um, uh, I'm sorry, for elastic waves, uh, here's the full. Uh, reflection coefficient, all right, and uh, you can see that uh, uh, the reflection coefficient is kind of proportional to the um, uh, and and the reflection coefficient I'll call R E, okay, reflection coefficient for elastic waves, and so the uh, uh, this reflection notice is is not doing it's it's altering the amplitude of the wave. It's not. It's not altering the shape or the phase of the wavelet. So we start with the source wavelet s, and then the uh, with the reflected wavelet t. I mean, of course, you know, depending on where you observe it, it's going to be delayed. But it's the same wavelet. Okay, it's just scaled by this scape constant scalar, the uh, the reflection, the elastic reflection coefficient. Okay, and and R e, uh, you know, if you look it up in Aki and Richards. Is uh, is this? It's basically the difference between the ratio of, uh, of the sort of the cross ratio of the uh, uh, densities, right? Rho two, you know, the rho below over alpha above minus the rho above divided by the alpha below, right? And then it's also multiplied by the sum of the of this cross ratio uh, involving the uh, uh, involving the um, uh, the uh, s velocity is beta. Okay, so uh, you know that's uh, um, uh, not simple, but it's easy. It's easy to use um, for acoustic waves. It's even easier. It involves some con some concepts that we uh, we maybe are more familiar with. Okay, <clears throat> now now notice the trouble here. You know what if we're doing a chirp survey in a lake? 
right, in the water and probably in a lot of the mud at the bottom of the lake, beta is zero. You know, the, the s velocity is zero. It's just too fluid. Okay, maybe the s velocity is uh, you know twenty meters a second, but that's you know that's ridiculously low. It's it might as well be zero, right? Because look what's going to happen here. Those low s velocities are just going to blow up this reflection coefficient, and and then particularly you know for an actual fluid with zero s velocity, it's 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 going to be you know it you, it doesn't work, right? You got to do something else. So so here's the the old familiar acoustic wave. Uh, um, Reflection coefficient R a, all right, and uh, R a is uh, as you as you know. I mean, we're assuming beta is zero everywhere, so that's uh, and we'll just set that aside. It's um, rho one times alpha one, and you might remember that's the acoustic impedance of medium one, right? It's the density times the velocity, um, and so it's the difference between the impedances. Uh, divided by, you know, kind of scaled, normalized by the sum of the impedances. Okay, and that's uh, that's crucial to to remember, right? Um, uh, notice that this this equation becomes much simpler if the you, you could simplify this equation without losing much precision uh, if um, if the difference in the uh, if the difference is much much smaller. Than the uh, than the background, right? If you if you um, and, and that's that's true for most reflectors, you know. Um, I mean the the ground surface, the water surface, yeah. The reflection coefficient is one, uh, so the difference is uh, is huge. Uh, but um, for um, um, uh, for uh, the uh, uh, you know, say one mud layer to another at the bottom of Pyramid Lake, um, which was so interesting in Amy's thesis. Um, you know, these differences are uh, are way smaller than the uh, uh, than the total uh, uh, impedances. So uh, uh, you know, like less than five percent, and the reflection coefficients are on the order of one percent to five uh, percent, which is pretty normal. You know. All the reflections you're looking at in most surveys are, are from these very low reflection coefficients, uh, and you can see that uh, you know um, the acoustic and the elastic reflection coefficients are fundamentally different. Um, you know, even though they're both fairly simple at this uh, at normal uh, incidence only, <clears throat> and they uh, they come you know they they come from different assumptions, different wave equations. Uh, you know different boundary conditions on on integrating across the boundary and all that. So uh, uh, it's uh, that's why they're so they're so different. Uh, so <clears throat> you know already we're we're in trouble, right? Because uh, you may have heard about seismic uh, uh, modeling, where you 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 take the uh, uh, you know traditional seismic modeling uh, to match the uh, you take uh, the uh, the alpha and the rho from the well logs, and you um, you calculate these uh, these acoustic impedances and how they change up and down the well, and then you you just you basically convolve that with a uh, um, with a source wavelet, right? That's that's all you have to do here, right? Convolve it with a source wavelet, and uh, and then you have a synthetic seismogram for you know normal incidence uh, normal incidence uh, uh, reflection, and um, and and that's the that's where we get into trouble, okay? Because we're in a real elastic Earth, but we're trying to make conclusions about density and and velocity on the basis of amplitudes, elastic amplitudes, but we're using the wrong equation, okay? Um, it wasn't until about uh, twenty years ago. That we actually learned how to log uh, shear velocities, and so now you can use the right equation, but you're still going to be, uh, you know, there's still a lot of things that are unaccounted for. All right, <clears throat> so you know, in Open Detect, in in Kingdom, all of that size, all of that modeling is is based on you know erroneous assumptions. Okay, it works pretty well though, doesn't it? <laughs> so uh, you know what what's going on here? All right. Okay. So uh, uh, and here's here's why uh, here here's why there's not so much trouble. Okay. Um, 
we have, as I just explained, our you know, here's a here's a a situation where we have uh, this is known as an asymptotic approach. This is uh, Wu and Aki's approach. <clears throat> um, we have uh, uh, we have a background density rho zero, a background. Uh, now I'm going to switch. You know, from from the two velocities, I'm going to I'm going to go to the the moduli, right? So we got uh, the Lomé lambda modulus, and we got uh, the uh, the background uh, shear modulus uh, mu zero, uh, and then down below the reflector, you know, there's uh, the density becomes the background density plus a little bit, uh, or minus a little bit. Uh, it it becomes the background um, Lomé lambda plus a little bit. It becomes the background uh, shear modulus plus a little bit, and the little bits, you know, really are small. Um, you know, delta rho is much much less than rho zero. Delta lambda is much much less than lambda zero. Delta mu is much much less than than mu zero. Okay, and and um, you know, one common question is, well, how much less? All right, because our 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 data are are noisy and uh, and they're not our amplitude data are not very accurate. They're not very specific themselves. Um, this has worked where, say, lamb, you know, delta lambda is fifty percent of lambda zero, okay, which seems wildly crazy, but uh, uh, it it sort of works, okay. I mean, formally, you know, you ought to be, you know, your deltas here ought to be like one percent, you know, maybe five percent at the outside, uh, but I've seen it work very often when when the deltas are twenty percent of the backgrounds, okay. And even fifty percent, you can still get something out of it. So that, that's that's one reason why um, you know why using this uh, uh, acoustic reflection coefficient you know works in uh, in all the popular software packages. Okay. Uh, notice that here is an elastic reflection coefficient approximated. You know, is basically um, delta rho over rho zero minus delta lambda over uh, lambda zero plus two mu zero minus uh, two delta mu over uh, lambda zero plus two mu zero. Okay, so this still works. You know, if, if we have mu zero, if we're in water and mu zero uh, and beta zero are both zero, then uh, this this equation still works. We can still get an acoustic. We can still get a reflection coefficient in acoustic media, and as shear velocity drops, you know, the reflection coefficient doesn't go crazy. Okay, so this this asymptotic approach of Wuanaki works very well, and and uh, that's really one reason why uh, this approach, uh, the modeling approach, works well too. Uh, okay, so that's a, a little uh, information about uh, uh, what the amplitudes of our reflections might mean, right? So, um, you know, if we are in an acoustic medium, and uh, and we see uh, we see the uh, 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 and, and we think that velocity is not changing, right? That means okay. So mu is is zero, delta mu is zero. So so this term goes away in an acoustic medium, all right. And if we think that velocity doesn't change, right? Then uh, uh, there's no delta lambda, right? If if because if the p velocity doesn't change, there's no way for lambda to change. So everything's at lambda zero. So this part goes away. So the only only way we get a reflection coefficient is is having changes in density, okay? And so that that can, we can represent here. And if we have changes in density and uh, and velocity is change, if we have no change in density and velocity is changing, then uh, you know here's how you calculate the reflection coefficient, okay? So that all that all can work pretty well. <clears throat> all right. Um, and here's another way of, of breaking up our, our information. You know, I, I, I now I've I've talked about the direct and the interacting waves. I've talked about the kinematic information and the the uh, dynamic information, the amplitudes. Okay, and and um, uh, where is where is this dynamic uh, part going to lead us? Uh, you know, if we can if we can recover those amplitudes, what are we going to try to do with them? All right, and um, so here's uh, uh, here's what we would like to know in an acoustic medium. Again, 
you know, going back to the, the simple assumptions used by the, uh, you know, the, the basic software packages, all right? We have an incompressibility and we have a density, all right? You know, incompressibility k is equal to lambda plus 2 mu. So um, uh, that, you know, that works in an acoustic medium. Uh, and I guess, yeah, I, you know, I, I, I haven't looked at this in a while, but, but in an acoustic medium, k is lambda. So the incompressibility is lambda uh, in, uh, in water. Okay, and uh, yeah, I, I always have trouble telling people what lambda is, uh, but it's just the incompressibility in an acoustic medium. Um, the things I, I, I used to know that I've, I've forgotten, let me tell you. Um, okay, so if we, if we could separate out density versus incompressibility, right, then we could... Um, you know, from our well logs, we know that different formations have different ratios of um, of k to rho, right? So a uh, a salt is going to have a very high incompressibility and a very uh, and a and a relatively low density. A um, a granite is going is also going to have a high incompressibility, but it's going to have a much higher density, okay, than the salt. All right, so. Uh, uh, and uh, you know shale and fractured zones and zones of uh, of more porosity and permeability, you know those are all going to uh, uh, have uh, different ratios. So, you know if 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 we are trying to you know project out from our well logs with our seismic data and and figure out the actual stratigraphy, the actual um, you know geology that our reflections are looking at. We'd like to be able to separate the incompressibility from the density. Okay. Uh, trouble is, we can't measure e either of those directly. Here's what we can actually measure. All right. We can measure from the the, the kinematic part. Okay. Um, you know, from the arrival times, from the uh, uh, the propagation times. From the propagation angles, you know, from Snell's law, we can we can back calculate velocity, okay, and and so that we can get what we might call measurements of velocity. I mean, there are interpretations of velocity, but uh, there's still some kind of uh, of measurement. All right, and velocity, of course, you know, an acoustic medium is the square root of k over rho. It's it, you know, it has to do with the the ratio of these, right? Uh, and then um, from the the strength, the amplitude of the reflections, from the dynamic part of the wave field, from the interactions rather than the propagation, you know we can we can observe, we can we can back calculate to uh, and make estimates of reflection coefficient r. Okay, but the reflection coefficient is basically the uh, the, the, uh, and, and really, there's deltas here, right? But there's uh, it's the square root of of uh, uh, well, I'm sorry, not not the reflection coefficient. This is the impedance r, okay? So we can get to estimates of the impedance from the dynamic part, and that's the square root of of k times rho. All right. So uh, you know what we can measure has this complicated relationship to what we would like to find out. You know, we've got to wait till we punch a, a well log through the stratigraphy before we can actually separately measure k and rho. All right. Uh, you know, density logs is, uh, uh, is, a, is a tricky, it's a tricky matter. Um, and there are many, many ways of, of trying to measure density in boreholes. Um, so uh, uh, now, now here's a piece of information. Our reflectivity section that we're deriving by migration, by imaging, you know, R of x and z and how it varies, is really like the, and here's where the, the differences come in, it's, it's approximately, you know, broadly, it's the gradient of the log of the impedance. Right? So it, it's, you know, how the impedance changes, right? So you take the impedance and it varies wildly. So you take the log of it so it doesn't vary quite so wildly. And, and then um, uh, <clears throat> you look at the, uh, at the spatial uh, derivatives, right? That's what the gradient is. And that tells you, you know, the, 
the size of the reflectivity uh, of the reflection coefficient and the reflectivity that we're we're getting from our uh, from our migrations. Okay, so that's the dynamic part of our migrated sections are the are these sizes of the reflectivity, and you can see now that they're related to the the spatial derivatives across the uh, <clears throat> the impedance field. But still, even with that, you know. That's still got this complex relationship between k and rho. It doesn't separate them at all. All right. Now, all right. Well, you might say, well, but but why? Because you know, if I get a reflectivity section, and uh, so I, I'm, I'm sorry, an impedance section, so capital R of x and z, and I derive separately a velocity section of x and z, then I I, ju I can just you know find it with these ratios. All right. With uh, you know. To get k, I just take v times the impedance. To get rho, I just take the impedance divided by the velocity, and then that you know that gets me everything I need to know. The trouble is is that the v comes from the v estimates come from the kinematic part of the data set, and the the impedance r's come from the dynamic part of the data set. These are two different processes, two different methods, and and. What Clairbout is pointing out here is that the processes we use to estimate these, the V and R, are fundamentally different and they operate over different wavelengths in space. So let's consider how we get reflection velocities, right? Um, we determine reflection velocities from travel times, you know, so the travel time between the source and a, and a distant receiver, you know, at least halfway down the cable, right? Halfway down the length of our of our experiment, thousands of meters, you know, for most uh, uh, most you know uh, oil and geothermal scale uh, reflection surveys, right? Thousands of meters. That's the scale of the measurement of travel time, and thus you know how we can back out that velocity information. You know whether we're using tomography or or matching uh, uh, normal move out velocities. Uh, uh, you know any 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 you know uh, optimization, all of that is being done over scales of thousands of meters. Okay, and and because that that seismic ray that's going a thousand meters, you know, halfway down the cable, uh, halfway down the spread, you know that 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 one seismic arrival has averaged through a whole bunch of of little uh, a whole bunch of you know little changes in velocity. And and by and we we pick its arrival time at the very end of that whole averaging process, okay? So that you know and and that time pick is good, you know. It's it's quite accurate, and we know the distance quite accurately, right? I mean, we're doing a poor job of surveying if we don't know the distance, you know, down to the uh, down to the foot. So um, uh, so the accuracy of our velocity. Is is very good, you know. If I make a scale of accuracy, and then this is this is like a spectrum, right? This is two hertz, ten hertz. Uh, you know, this is a, a, a semi-log scale of um, of uh, frequency uh, or or you know inverse wavelength, right? So the short wavelength information, you know, the information about that, you know, those tiny changes in in velocity. That, that that seismic ray averaged through, right? That's all up here above 10 hertz, okay. And you can see that the you know our ability to distinguish those those tiny changes in velocity is really slim. We have almost no ability, you know, with this you know thousand. Uh, okay, we can we can uh, uh, the tiny change in velocity. We got to drill a well and put a put a. a, a, a a sonic tool down the well, which is basically a refraction survey on the scale of one meter. Then we can see the one meter changes in velocity. Okay, no problem. Uh, but we're not going to see the one meter scale changes in velocity from a seismic wave that's propagating a thousand meters. Okay, uh, so our accuracy is high, but only at low frequencies. Okay, we measure impedances by looking at the amplitudes of reflected waves. Okay. And and that's at the you know those amplitudes of the reflected waves they're affected by distances by sizes of reflectors that are on the order of the wavelength of these waves. Now for most exploration surveys, 
we're talking tens of meters, okay? And so, um, you know, our, our, our wavelength of the waves uh, is uh, tens of meters. Now, now, you know, there might only be one reflection. You know, you only see a particular, you're, you're picking an amplitude uh, uh, of a reflection on one seismogram. Okay, so so you know, say on on uh, one part of a uh, of a piece of stratigraphy in Pyramid Lake, you know, there's exactly one chirp trace that that sees that that one place. So the the you know, you ask, okay, where where are we measuring that? Well, we know pretty well. You know, we know within uh, well with a chirp trace, we know within probably uh, less than a meter of where that reflection came from okay but it's only one trace and so you know and the and and the um, you know there, there's the noise of the waves slapping against the the boat and you know there's all these other effects that are um, interfering in our ability to measure that amplitude accurately so that's this red trace here in the in this sort of accuracy spectrum right we're seeing higher frequency information but it's less accurate okay so, so we're trying to combine. We're trying to combine the velocity view with the uh, with the impedance view v and r, right? And we put these two spectra together, and suddenly realize, uh oh, we have a gap. These actually don't cross. There is no frequency where we have decent dynamic information and good velocity information. And so, so. That's why, um, uh, and, and I, this, I always shiver when this happens. Um, uh, you know, if you if you've uh, if you've looked at uh, background of, of, of three component seismic work uh, on geothermal areas, you've probably turned up some papers on the geysers. And there's been a lot of work by Livermore Lab and, and uh, UC Berkeley and others, where they uh, they'll make a, um, a Poisson's ratio model. You know, like a uh, of, of, of the, uh, it's, they, they claim to be doing a tomography of Poisson's ratio uh, across some body in the geysers. Okay? And if you look at those papers, you'll notice that, that they say, yeah, you know, in a lot of places we're getting these ridiculous values, and so we just cut them out. You know, we're not going to show them to you. Um, and those ridiculous values are because of this gap. Okay? They, are, they, are get, they get one image of uh, p velocity. And, and one image of s velocity, and there's enough of a gap even between those two velocity measurements, you know, on this on this spectrum here, that uh, uh, that there's just not enough overlap to get an accurate calculation of of the ratio, you know, the Vp over the Vs, say, or the Poisson's ratio. Okay, so um, uh, you know that's been a very common feature. In in many uh, uh, many analyses, uh, you try to you try to take you know get the the at a particular place you know you're looking at some very long wavelength information about velocity, and you got some very specific information about uh, about uh, uh, impedance, and so you try to multiply them together to get the uh, uh, to get the density, and uh, and it just goes crazy. You know, because the information's at a, at different scales of measurement, and and they just don't work together. Okay, so the gap is very severe for our surveys, and then you know even where you're trying to contrast uh, two different kinds of velocity, there's there is usually still a gap. So um, you know, velocity is you can get it more accurately because you're sampling a large area many times for a good average. The impedance of a single small reflector may only be sampled once, and they're quite a ways away. You know, the velocity is accurate over scales; it's averaged over scales of the the cable length. You know, a thousand meters. The uh, the density. Uh, I'm mean, sorry. The uh, uh, the impedance we're measuring from seismic amplitudes, reflection amplitudes, uh, that are over a scale of tens of meters, maybe even uh, single meters. Uh, and they're not as accurate, but they're much more specific. So the relation between V and R is problematic. We can't, we can't separate K from rho. We can only know their components at different wavelengths. And that's a, that's a huge problem. So when we try to invert seismic amplitudes, you know, here's what we're hoping for. 
you know, we're we're hoping to uh, to to be able to add together, you know, a, a, a K product at the same uh, scale as a row product, okay, and and you know, if we can if we can set these off against each other, then we could analyze rock type, right, and and uh, and get a you know get a driller's log. That's that's you know get a geologic log. That's our that's our that's our uh, 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 our, our objective here, you know, the ultimate objective would be to to make a stratigraphic column or a or a or a geologic log. Okay, but here's what we what we're really faced with. Okay, uh, even if we if we have a known model, you know, we can construct a known model, and we use that to that model to produce uh, some synthetic data. We can analyze that synthetic data for velocity, but the velocity is going to come out to be this slowly varying thing in in depth. As well as uh, as laterally, and that's because that comes from the kinematic travel time measurements, and the impedance is going to be this rapidly varying thing, you know. And I, I put these steps in it because it's just not as accurate, you know. I mean, the velocity, you know, we can tell the difference between you know here and ten percent back, you know, that's a real measurement, that's really there. Here, you know, we can't tell the difference so well between uh, the velocity here and one meter away. You know, it, it, if it's only ten percent different, it's not going to come out on our analysis. So what we end up doing is trying to add these uh, the velocity to the impedance, but the dynamic measurements are at a much finer scale, and you can see that we don't you know we don't recover what uh, uh, what we want <clears throat> because we can't we can't separate out that properly separate out that k and rho. Um, the separability does help later. Okay, this again, you know, uh, here's why I here's why I, I like to separate wave fields into direct waves, which depend only on the velocity, versus um, uh, versus um, interacting waves, which interact where we have changes in impedance. Okay, and this is also why you know seismic modeling from well logs works. Okay, uh, because the the well logs are telling us about this rapid variation. The well logs are not so good at, at giving us this slow velocity uh, uh, change. That's actually uh, why VSP was developed: vertical seismic profiles. Okay. So, um, uh, you know, this is how we're we're able to look on our medium as as having this uh, <coughs> separation. Between uh, um, direct waves and interacting waves, and the interacting waves, the reflections, which is all we're, th we're thinking about here when we're when we're doing migration, the reflections come from this reflectivity section, which is mostly delta functions, right? You know, there's a there's a limited number of delta functions in here, you know, in this impedance column. <clears throat> so um, uh, that's why we have this, you know, spiky. Uh, reflectivity section, and also why you know we're we're willing to smooth and, and it sort of it sort of works. We smooth out our velocity so much it becomes constant. Okay, so that's the justification now for our constant velocity sections where we're looking at reflectivity. <clears throat> okay, uh, but I gotta I gotta warn you about another mismatch, uh, and I'll get part way into it, and then we'll we'll have to break until Monday. Um, so I'm going to derive the acoustic wave equation, and um, we're going to see that that you know this actually doesn't work. Okay, uh, we can't uh, we can't have constant velocity and have a reflectivity section with the the equation that we're using for uh, for migration. Okay, uh, in in fact it's uh, it's quite remarkable, uh, and it doesn't. Doesn't make any sense to the uh, uh, to the traditional earthquake seismologists that migration works at all. Okay, it it just shouldn't work. It doesn't. It violates all the assumptions that we're making. All right. So so uh, uh, you know all of this has to be solved uh, later on. Uh, but it would be unfair of me to teach you all these migration methods and then claim that that you know the physics in them is perfect. No, the, we're, what we're going to find out with this acoustic wave equation analysis is that the physics actually is, is faulty. 
Okay, how about that? Um, 